Hey, everybody. Welcome to Right On, the podcast from Final Draft. We are here to talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. Today, we have an interview with Stephen Knight, writer of the highly acclaimed film Spencer, starring Kristen Stewart. I'm getting quite serious about you. So stand very still and smile a lot. They know everything. They don't. Mummy, what happened to make you so sad? Well, here, in this house, there is no future. The past and the present are the same thing. Diana, they can't change. You have to change. You have to be able to do things you hate. You hate? There has to be two of you. It's the real one <laughs> and the one they take pictures of. Stephen and I discussed the film's unconventional take on a biopic, finding the human behind the icon of Diana, how his approach to writing differs between film and television projects, and more. Check it out. Stephen Knight, thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. It's a pleasure. So we're here, you know, mainly to talk about Spencer. I'm curious, let's just start at the top. How did you become involved with this project? Yeah, I got got a message that Pablo was in London and wanted to meet. And I'm a big admirer of his work. And so we had breakfast and he said, would you be interested in doing something about Diana? And that, that was the brief, really, which is... Nice and open. <laughs> it wasn't something that had preoccupied me, you know, in the years uh, since Diana's death, but being English, she inhabits our imaginations that had been engendered by her funeral, which had been a very un-English event. And it just, at the time, I thought, what is this connection between this woman and, and ordinary people? And I'd never sort of found an answer. I thought this would be a good occasion to try and answer that question. One of the things I really love about this movie is it's an unconventional approach in a lot of ways to the traditional biopic. You know, a lot of a lot of times people try to fit in everything from birth to someone's death in one movie and it, you kind of just don't really get a sense of the person whereas this focuses on a very short period of time and isn't you know, preoccupied with giving you every single biographical detail of this person's life. How did that sort of approach come to you? And then how did you zero zero on on this particular time period and this particular story specifically? Yeah, I I think very early on, both Flo and I decided that an actual biopic was a minefield. You know, it's, it's been tried and it didn't really work. And as you say, you know, if if you choose to do a whole life, you, you're given the beginning, middle and end. And you have no control over that. That's just what it is. So I was interested in, you know, the fact that throughout her life, there were snapshots of her, there were photographs of her. And I thought it'd be really interesting to do a snapshot, sort of take a very brief period and and really control the geography and the chronology and drill down entirely into her character and make it about trying to find the human being behind the icon, because everyone knows a lot of stuff about her. You don't need to explain that. She's not like a, an obscure figure. So a lot of that work is done. So therefore you can say, okay, this you probably have this idea of who she is, but look at this. And, and the authority for that came from talking to people who knew her and via that came across a particular Christmas when a decision was made at Sandringham. And I like Christmas because it gives you Christmas Eve boxing, uh, Christmas Day Boxing Day, which is sort yeah. of your thing. Um, And also it's sort of relatable to a lot of people that you've been stuck in a house with people you don't necessarily want to be with (laughs) for religious festival. And it's, you know, and we've all been there. And the the thing I was trying to get to with Diana is her ordinariness, that it was, you know, often a drama is an ordinary situation with an extraordinary person thrown into it. It's the opposite. It's an extraordinary situation with the royal family at Christmas. And here's this, what I think was a very relatable, ordinary person going into it and having to deal with the, the, the insanity of it. So you mentioned talking to people. What was the research process for you like on this? Your British Princess Di lives in the, like, as you mentioned earlier, lives in the sort of pop culture and your sort of collective unconscious, you know, she looms large. So what was the research process for you like when you were jumping into this project? I, I didn't watch any documentaries or films and didn't read any books 
because I think that if someone else has put together something that is a work of art or a piece of history, there is a given pattern. In other words, if you read a, a history book, it, it's as if whatever happened at the end is inevitable because I think history selects the moments that accumulate towards what the inevitable ending is. I'm much more interested in the chaos of reality that we all live. And we all know how chaotic and bonkers and bizarre it is mm-hmm. for all of us, not just for her. And so I concentrated on talking to people who were with her at this particular Christmas and just get the actual events that happened because real things are far more bizarre than anything you can invent always, you know, mm-hmm. without question. So the idea that someone with her condition was arriving at a house where she's going to be weighed when she arrives and weighed when she leaves. No one would dare make that up, but that, it's that, true. That sends shivers down my spine when <laughs> the idea of <laughs> weighing yourself before and after Christmas, that's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's like, you know, that those real things are used as stepping stones. And then between the real things, you can have the fable. You can, and the, the, the intention always was, this was possibly one of the most observed human beings in history, you know, in terms of she was filmed, she was photographed, she was watched, uh, commented upon. What I wanted to do was turn it around so that basically we're inside her head looking out. She's the observer and she's, and so what we see, you know, in its surreal moments and heightened reality is because that's what she's seeing. She's not well. And that's what she's seeing. That's what she's experiencing. So that was the, the plan. Fortunately, with Pablo and Kristen, it worked. So yes, you you mentioned the sort of fable like aspects to it and the surreal aspects. You know, there are parts of it where I'm watching this movie, and I watch a lot of movies where the, it was almost like a scarier than any horror movie I've seen this year. Um, yeah. And I'm curious, you know, when you're when you're writing that, when you're thinking about that, what what's what's going on in your head? You know, do you, are you, are you just extrapolating like this must have felt like a horror movie to her, so that's the direction we're going to go in? You know, because I'm thinking of the scene where she's eating the soup with the the pearls, yeah. or without too much into spoilers, the apparition she sees. Yeah, that, that stuff made it such a subjective experience. I felt like I was yeah. in her head. You just talk about just sort of how certain elements of the film felt like a horror movie, like, you know, what it must have felt like for her. Yeah, my writing process is quite peculiar in that what I try to do is to not plan in advance too much what any scene will be or even what the whole story will be, but to sort of let your fingers do it. So that it, it's almost like dreaming, if you like, where you know what the character is and you know the destination of where it's going, but just see what happens and, and let the dialogue sort of come And the thing that I suppose the instruction I gave to myself is that because this is a princess and it's a castle, it's a fairy tale. And I think most fairy tales are horror stories with a happy ending. If you think about any fairy story, they're horrible. You know, there's always (laughs) monsters and children getting eaten and kidnapped and, you know, it's, it's awful. And so I wanted to go there to make this a fairy tale with, and it does have a happy ending, but along the way, it's a princess who is held captive in a haunted castle. With that instruction in mind, then just let it go. And the pearls and the soup began with the idea of the white pearls and the green soup and colour contrast. And then the idea that she's got to, the whole thing about eating and rejecting food is that I felt that she was in a situation where she could not absorb what she was meant to absorb, whereas the other members of the family could. She couldn't just take it in. She had to get rid of it again. Mm -hmm. And so the food metaphor was very important all the way through. And the idea that this thing with the pearls, where obviously she's very hurt by that, she has to swallow it. You've got to swallow it. You've got to keep it. But she can't. (laughs) And quite right, you know. I'm curious, you met with Pablo before you started the project and, you know, kind of got a brief and you get to work. Knowing you're writing for a director like him and what, you know, stylistically he or aesthetically, you know, you, you kind of know you're going to have long shots of people walking and just thinking and, and things like that. I'm curious if that affects your writing process at all, if you're sort of visualizing for him or if you're just, if that doesn't come into play at all. It doesn't come into play specifically in terms of affecting what I write. What it does do, it, you know, you're in safe hands. So you can go down the road of seeing Amberlynn. And know that it's going to be okay because he'll go with it. You know, his 
st- I love the style of relaxing into the whole thing so that you can, she can just walk with it mm. and not be afraid of that. You're not trying to get to the next moment, you know. It, and mm. I think he directs in a similar way that I write, which is just whatever feels that rides at that moment, just do that, you know, and and go with it and see where it goes. And it looks so beautiful. I mean, he's such a, you know, he's such a brilliant director. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful looking movie. I'm curious, you know, watching this and then, you know, I'm going to, I'll say now, one of my favorite movies of the last several years is Locke. And that's a movie you wrote and directed. And, you know, both of these movies are about sort of single characters and internalizing, you know, you're really dealing a lot with what's going on with these characters internally. There's not some huge dramatic stakes really at play, maybe more so in Locke a little bit, but at the end of the day, you know, it's just about concrete. I'm mm. curious, you know, what's your approach to writing these characters and this drama that feels so intense and, you know, like life or death stakes when really, you know, it's, it's a Christmas weekend. In, in, yeah. in this case, you know, how did, how does that, how does your mind process these things? How do you dramatize those things on the page? What's your approach? Well, for me, you know, any story, it's a relief for me to be able to concentrate almost exclusively on what's going on inside someone's head. So we're not seeing cars pull up or cars crash or, you know, things explode and all of that. Because I think most people's lives are not that. Most people's lives are tragedies and comedies and, and thrillers that take place in a very con- uh, confined environment. And, you know, Locke is, it's a dilemma that wouldn't even make the local paper, <laughs> you know, never mind the national or international. It, it's not something that would concern other people. But for me, I enjoy most dialogue that is coming from an individual who is almost like the fox being hunted or the individual who is having to sword fight with all of these different things verbally because i think that's when i'm really interested in the way people really talk actually talk rather than the way people talk in movies or in tv Mm -hmm. because the way people actually talk is really interesting complicated and people will say one thing and say completely the opposite three seconds later and i just the closer i can get to that chaos of of how people really interact the, the, the happier i am and that that's when i feel for me that's in really when I can let let it completely go and just enter that world and just follow it because you're in with that human being. So Locke and Diana, you're right, are similar experiences for me. I'm curious then about something like, you know, because you're you're very prolific. You do all sorts of different genres. Something like Serenity seems kind of opposite that because that's very affected and it's you're, I mean, spoilers, yeah. I suppose, but you're not actually dealing with real people. I'm curious, yeah. like what, you know, so what's the difference for you when you're writing Diana or Locke versus yeah. something like Serenity? I, I try to, if I do a certain thing, the next thing I try to make it as opposite to the thing I just did as possible. And Serenity, you know, I directed it because no one else would touch it. <laughs> no one else would do it. And it was a completely bonkers idea that I love and I'm really proud of. For me, I think as a writer, you have to do what comes to you. When that idea comes or when that thing comes or when that scene comes or when that line comes, go with it. I think it's more difficult as a task to decide before you begin, well, this is something that is successful at the moment this is the sort of genre that people are watching so i'm going to do something similar to that for me writing is like playing an instrument where if you you know if you're playing the guitar or piano and you think about it that's not how you do it you just let it go you know if you're playing the piano you just do it and so i think if you if you're too rational about it this is just for me it's not for other people but just for me if if it's a rational decision then it's i find it very difficult to do Interesting. Um, you know, we're talking about, I, I brought up, you know, a couple of different projects and you're also, you know, you've got multiple television shows. I'm curious, you you must have several projects going at any given moment. You're bouncing between different stories and styles and all this sort of yeah. stuff. So how do you, you know, what's a typical day for you writing? You know, what, how does it take us from when you wake up to when you go to sleep? You know, what, how many projects are you working on? What's your strategy? I wake up very early. I find that an early the early hours when everybody else is asleep are the best times to write and the phone's not ringing. So you can just really get into it. And it's the first three or four hours, I think, are the best. The stuff that comes is the best. I tend, I, I wouldn't work typically on two different projects on the same day or even the same week. So I'd probably allocate two weeks or whatever to the project to get right, right, right into it. And I think the important thing is, is going into the project. So um, regularly shaved twice. <laughs> um, 
had two showers because if you're really in it, you don't, and I can't drive or anything if I'm right in it, because if you're really in it, then the sort of the, the real world sort of disappears a bit. Do you know what I mean? And so therefore it becomes like compulsive and then you just do it, do it, do it. And then when that's gone or you think you've finished it or you're happy with it, have a break and then you're into the next thing. But I, I, I actually love to write. I love to sit at the keyboard and write. If it's not an, you know, sometimes it's a commission and you're not, it's not your thing, but you're getting into it and you find a way in. But especially if it's something like Spencer where you're free to do what you want, it's just the most enjoyable thing. Is there a difference in your process when you're doing film versus a series? You know, obviously one is more collaborative than the other. So, or, you know, how does your approach vary between the two formats? Yeah, I mean, I love television because it's a writer's medium. You know, the writer gets a lot more control. And I think television allows for more unusual ideas to prosper. I think the 90 minute, two hour, it really is a different thing. So the the 90 minute, two hour movie with its beginning, middle and end, there are certain subjects you can really do with that. And if you're doing a family saga over a period of 10 years, you can't, you can't do that in 90 minutes. So you have to go for the, the more screen time. But I think in terms of how one writes, for me, it doesn't make any difference to how I actually sit down and write stuff. But it does give you the luxury of, for example, having a character be unsympathetic for a long time. With a movie, you can't do that. You can, you've can, you got to get the audience hooked into that character quite quickly. You know, And I just find the two things very different. Some projects you know should be a film and some you know should be TV, but TV is great. I think it's great you know, all around for the amount of content that's getting made. I think some great, great stuff is getting made all over the world. Mm-hmm. I just want to kind of take a little bit of a step back and I'm curious if you could talk about when you first knew you wanted to be a storyteller, you wanted to be a writer. Was it something that came to you? I mean, you love writing. Was it something that you've yeah. known since you were very young? Did it come a little bit later in life? What was your journey like there? I mean, it was a very odd one because I come from a background where becoming a writer just isn't the thing that was expected. <laughs> My dad was a blacksmith a farrier and worked with horses. I'm on seven kids. And so it was a big crowded house <laughs> where one was expected to work with horses and be a blacksmith. So it wasn't a house full of books, if you like. But I went to school as the way there was a particular teacher and I wrote some stuff and the teacher said, this is really good. And when you're nine or 10 and someone tells you you're good at something, in a way you become good at it because somebody's told you you are. <laughs> and so I just thought, well, that's it. That's what I'm going to be. I'm going to be a writer. Um, and that was from, yeah, really early age, 10, probably 10 years old. Wow. And then from there, what were the sort of practical steps you took to turn that, you know, passion into a career? I went to, I was, went to university, which again was not what was expected, but I, I, I went to university and then worked in radio. And if anybody says to me about you know, becoming a writer, I would recommend radio. Absolutely. Because it's just the words and there's no budget. So you can you can blow up Mars if you want on radio, <laughs> and it's just such a great medium. And, and usually there's a very strong time constraint, so you have to get everything right within that format. And then from there, I went on to comedy, television comedy, and again, comedy is a great discipline. It's like if everybody knows, if you're telling a joke in a bar and you get one word wrong, or you get the emphasis wrong, or you stumble, or you hesitate, the joke disappears. It's not funny anymore. Mm-hmm. And it just teaches you the importance of every single word, every single pause has a purpose. And then I sort of luckily got out of comedy because it's so brutal and it's so <laughs> hard and moved into, I, I wrote a couple of novels and then the fourth novel was going to be Dirty Pretty Things, but I thought I would do it as a screenplay. And from there, that's what I did. And then in, in the middle of all that, you, I, I, I'm not sure how many of our listeners would be aware of this, you created or co-created Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, the format for yeah. the game show that would go on to take many hours of my parents away from me. <laughs> I'm curious, what, like, just out of curiosity, how that how that came about. You're writing fiction, and then this seems like an anomaly in the, in the grand scheme of things. Well, it was very weird and fortuitous, I suppose, because I was working at a company called, or working with a company called Celador. There was myself and a, another writer, uh, and we were writing comedy. And we wrote comedy shows for this production company. And if you walked up another flight of stairs, it was where game shows were made. And so we, as well as writing comedy, we, along with somebody called David Briggs, used to sit at lunchtime and think of game show formats. And so <laughs> we did 
We did a few, which did well in Europe. A couple did well in the UK. And then we started talking about this idea about grains of rice. You know that thing where if you get one grain of rice on a chessboard, Sure, sure. And then two on the left. By the end of the chessboard, you've covered India to a depth of 30 <laughs> feet. Right. So, so it was the idea of doubling it up or, or exponentially increasing the reward. And we worked on it. And at the time when we presented it, the, all the TV stations in the UK said quiz shows are dead. <laughs> They're so old fashioned, you know, and, and they were old fashioned. But somehow we, well, someone played with a commissioning editor for real with his money. <laughs> and that, that sort of concentrated his mind so he, he got made and at first we thought well you know this is good it's doing well here and then it just went mad yeah. <laughs> that, that is insane a couple more questions before we wrap up like i said you're prolific you write a lot you you both write for other directors and you write stuff that you yourself direct I'm curious. I mean, like it sounded like it, with Serenity, that wasn't necessarily the case that you knew you were going to be directing that going in. Um, whereas with Spencer, you're writing this specifically for yeah. Pablo. Yeah. How does that change your approach? I'm curious, like knowing whether or not you're going to direct it or if you're planning to direct it versus not. Actually, once the script is finished, you realize that no one else will do this. <laughs> no one else will be stupid enough to direct this. So you direct it yourself. But I, I am absolutely, totally consider myself to be a writer who if necessary directs <laughs> um you know because it's it's brutally hard. i've got nothing but a huge admiration for directors it's such a brutally hard thing to do and for me writing is the pleasure directing is sort of the necessity if if one does it yeah i, I think that the decision whether or not to direct it comes after the script i mean Locke was great i, I wrote that knowing i was going to direct it which is why it was only a 10 day shoot 10 um, days oh my goodness yeah we shot it in 10 days wow um i'm a big believer in going back to basics like if you're making a film what what you're trying to do is get people into a room turn the lights off and get them to look at a screen mm -hmm. that's the only rule and and come out of it happy you know and i think the film business attracts rules like no other art form and sometimes I think it's good to just forget those rules and just go back to the basics of what it's meant to be. I love that. The last question before we wrap up, is there something you've learned along the course of your career that you wish you knew when you were first starting out? Yeah, loads of things. I would say don't think that there is a right way of doing it. In other words, I think when you're setting out, you think I'm going to make this as much like another thing that was, that was made as possible. Because that means it's a real film. If it's like that film that got made, then it must be right. Because it's like that. Whereas I think the thing that writers, I think, should try to do is, especially those first 10 pages, is make it as unlike anything that anybody's ever seen. Because we all know that the people who are going to read the script have read a thousand scripts mm -hmm. that month. And I've seen it all, know it all. But if, you, if something happens when they're reading it that they weren't expecting, you have attention. And the other thing I always say is finish it. If you start it, finish it. Because if, if you keep starting things and don't finish them, you, you never have an object that you can take anymore. I, I love that. Well, congrats on the film on Spencer. I hope as more and more people see it, they're you know just captured by this incredible portrait into this figure that I feel like I had so many great conversations after the movie just discussing, you know, both Diana, but also like stressful Christmases and like food anxiety, yeah, exactly. things like that. So it's really rich text like that. So I hope more and more people get it. Congrats. And thank you so much for taking the time to chat. No, great interview. It's really interesting. Thank you. Thanks to Stephen Knight for coming on the show. You can catch Spencer on VOD platforms right now. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you liked this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about new episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and on Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This podcast was produced by Kayla Guess and co-produced by Emma Vranich. Editing is by Sean Bonnet. Music is by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Really?